It was February of 1984, and 25-year-old Terry Brooks had just landed her perfect job. As the young woman with bright blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair backed her car out of her parents' driveway and headed west towards the Oxford Valley Mall, she glanced at her watch. Terry had always made a point of being on time, but as the brand-new assistant manager of a busy and popular fast-food restaurant, she now made a point of arriving a little bit early. Not so early that she got underfoot of the waitstaff or appeared to be that over-eager manager who was looking over everybody's shoulders at how they were doing their jobs, but Terry had only been assigned to this Roy Rogers restaurant in Bucks County, Pennsylvania one week before, and so she wanted to make sure that she set a positive example as a capable, reliable manager who was friendly, but also very professional. As Terry drove the 13 miles from her parents' neat house in the quiet suburb of Warminster to the busy intersection of Route 1 and Oxford Valley Road in Fairless Hills, she hardly noticed the unusually warm weather. Even though it was a surprising and welcome change from eastern Pennsylvania's typical chilly winter afternoons. In fact, Terry's life recently had been so busy and so full of changes and plans that the only remarkable thing about her commute to work was that it offered her a rare 30 minutes of quiet where she could try to organize her thoughts and prepare herself for the 10-hour shift ahead of her. It wasn't the actual work that Terry worried about. She already knew from past experience a lot about what went on inside of a restaurant. Ever since high school and right through the summers that she had spent home from college, Terry had done what most of her friends had also done, gotten summer jobs and part-time jobs as servers at local eateries. But once Terry had graduated from the University of Maryland almost four years ago with a degree in personnel management, she had decided to parlay that real-life work experience into a corporate job that would be a step closer to a professional career in the food service industry or in human resources. So about seven months earlier, back in July of 1983, Terry had left her longtime job as manager at a local Italian restaurant called Cucci's in her hometown of Warminster and taken a job with Roy Rogers, a chain of fast food restaurants that was owned by the Marriott Corporation, one of the country's giants in the hospitality industry. Even though the move meant that Terry would be taking an initial pay cut and that she would start with the Roy Rogers team not as a manager but as an assistant manager, Terry did not for a minute second-guess her decision to leave Coochie's. Because for Terry, taking charge of her life was something that came naturally. When her parents divorced back when Terry was in the eighth grade, the four Brooks children had gone to live with their father, George Brooks. Older than her two younger sisters and their youngest brother, Terry had immediately taken on more responsibility for her siblings. And even after her father had remarried, Terry was known to her family and friends for her dependability and her unwavering sense of purpose. As Terry's good friend, Cindy Bradney, who was a bartender at Coochie's Restaurant, put it, Terry was one of the few people in their circle of friends in Warminster who had gone to college and who had come back home with a plan for going on to bigger and better things. But Terry's good looks and outstanding academic performance, along with her ambition and intelligence, was coupled with such genuine friendliness and kindness that she was more likely to inspire affection and trust than she was to inspire envy. And that was saying a lot, because in the early winter of 1984, it looked like Terry was living the kind of charmed life that everybody wants to have. After finishing college, Terry had made the difficult but very smart decision to end a serious relationship that had become strained and even physically abusive. And when Terry had fallen in love again, almost a year ago, it was with a 22-year-old local man who was a cook at Coochie's, where she used to work. Unlike Terry or her ex-boyfriend, Albert Scott Keefe, who went by his middle name, Scott, had not gone to college. But he was a hard worker, and he appreciated that combination of warmth and competence that made Terry really stand out from the crowd. Turning her attention away from the road just for a moment, Terry glanced down at the engagement ring on her left hand. She and Scott had known within weeks of meeting each other at Coochie's that their mutual attraction would lead to more than just a casual workplace romance. And sure enough, three months later, Scott had asked Terry to marry him, and with a radiant smile, Terry had said yes. Since then, the couple had been busy working and saving money for their upcoming wedding, which was planned for July 14th. With Scott living at his mom's house just three miles from where Terry was living with her parents, the two of them had just decided the week before that they could afford to put money down on a 10-day honeymoon to Hawaii. 
The moment the two of them had walked into the travel agency in nearby Doylestown, Pennsylvania, three days ago, it had been both exciting and nerve-wracking. For Terry, the sight of the brochures that described Hawaii's sandy beaches, rugged coastlines, waterfalls, rainforests, and volcanoes suddenly made both the honeymoon and the wedding seem not only very real, but also very close. As Terry passed by the shops and strip malls and slices of farmland and cornfields that stretched out along either side of Route 132 East, she suddenly felt overwhelmed. There was so much to do and plan over the next five and a half weeks, starting with the shopping trip she and her stepmother would make tomorrow to see if they could find a wedding gown for Terry. For Scott, Terry's career change also meant a few adjustments, mostly that Terry's new job with Roy Rogers meant that they would no longer see each other every day at Coochie's, where they both used to work. But Terry and her family had appreciated the effort Scott made to check in on her now that she was working the night shift at a restaurant much further away from her home in Warminster. Although the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers was not located in a high crime area, the clientele and overall vibe of the restaurant were very different from that of Coochie's. Instead of a local customer base and quiet location, Terry's Roy Rogers was stationed right at the intersection of two heavily used major roadways. By design, the fast food restaurant with its western theme and signature roast beef sandwiches was a brightly lit glass-sided cube of warmth and invitation that was intended to entice an endless stream of hungry travelers, many of whom would never return. But so far, any trouble that Terry had experienced at work had not come from customers. Instead, it had come from Roy Rogers' staff. Two months earlier, while training at a different Roy Rogers, Terry had had a very nasty confrontation with an employee who outright refused to follow a simple order she had given him. Instead, Steve Daly blew up at her, called her terrible names, and became physically aggressive. Management had immediately fired this guy, but for a while, he still came back to the restaurant as a customer and sat glowering at Terry and her staff from one of the tables. More recently, at the Roy Rogers in Fairless Hills, her Roy Rogers, as she liked to remind herself, there had been an issue with one of the cash registers coming up $40 short at the end of a shift. Terry had had her suspicions about an employee named Barb who worked at her location but soon after Terry had confronted her staff, the missing money had turned up, returned to the safe in an unmarked envelope. So it was probably no wonder, Terry thought to herself as she approached the intersection of North Oxford Road and US Route 1, that Scott was concerned about her safety and often came to sit in the restaurant after closing to make sure she and any other late night staff were not left there alone. Seeing the Roy Rogers sign in the distance, Terry reminded herself to call Scott later that evening and tell him that she'd be later than usual that night since she had to catch up on some important paperwork. As Terry turned on her car blinker and prepared to enter the Roy Rogers parking lot, she also made a mental note to let Scott know that she'd be fine. There was no need for him to come by and sit with her. It was Friday, February 3rd, and Terry knew Scott had an early shift the next morning, and there would be two teenagers staying there with her in the restaurant cleaning until about 1.30 a.m. So Scott didn't need to worry. Terry would not be alone. A minute later, and Terry had parked the car and turned off the engine. As she gathered her brown purse and slipped her car keys into the pocket of her light purple jacket, she glanced at herself in the rearview mirror. Straightening the collar of her Roy Rogers maroon dress shirt, Terry felt a thrill of accomplishment and hope. She'd only been working for the Marriott Corporation less than a year, but already Terry had learned so much about running a business and being a supervisor. And even the recent challenges had given her a chance to apply some of what she had learned in college about personnel management. And those conflicts had also been good practice on how to stand up for herself and be authoritative when it came to expressing expectations and consequences. A few minutes later, her blonde hair glowing under the light spilling out of the big glass windows of the wood-framed restaurant, Terry stepped up to the outer door leading into her Roy Rogers. At 6.45 a.m. the next morning, Saturday, February 4th, 1984, Scott was passing by Terry's parents' house on his way to work when he noticed that Terry's car was not parked in its usual spot in the Brooks' driveway. Puzzled, Scott slowed down. 
At 10 p.m. the night before, Terry had called him to say she'd be working late. Terry had been very busy, so their conversation was short, but Scott was sure he remembered every word correctly. Honey, don't worry about me, Terry had told him. I have some paperwork to finish tonight, but there are two other people that will be here with me. Coming to a sudden decision, Scott pulled his truck up to the curb. Despite the early hour, he decided to check in with Terry's parents just to make sure Terry had made it home okay the night before. Hopping out of his truck and heading for the front door of the house, Scott glanced at his watch. He was probably worrying for no reason, and he'd be back on the road in just a minute. And besides, even with the unplanned stop he was making, he'd still have enough time before his shift even started to enjoy a cigarette and a cup of coffee once he arrived at work. But a few minutes later, Scott was sitting down inside the Brooks' kitchen, staring at Terry's parents with a stunned look on his face. Both Elizabeth and George Brooks had just checked Terry's bedroom and found that it was empty. The bed was made, and there was no sign anywhere in the house of their oldest daughter. As Terry's 51-year-old father stepped to the kitchen phone and dialed the number of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant 30 minutes away, Scott pushed himself slowly to his feet, and he and Terry's mother, Elizabeth, leaned forward, straining to hear the voice on the other end of the line. The call was answered by a police officer. One hour earlier, at about 6 a.m., the manager of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers had arrived, as he always did on Saturday mornings, to open up the restaurant and get things ready for the breakfast shift. It wasn't until Joseph Hampton reached the front door and found it unlocked that he had the first inkling that something might be wrong. There was a second inner door to the restaurant that stayed open during business hours, but locked automatically when staff closed it behind them and left for the night. But this outer door had to be locked using a key, and obviously someone had failed to do that. Suddenly alert, the manager stepped inside, unlocked the second door, and turned to look at the tables and booths in the dining area. Seeing that nothing appeared to be out of order, he relaxed slightly as he stepped behind the counter with its bank of cash registers into the small rectangular prep area in the entryway to the kitchen. That's when he stopped. In a faint glow of light shining out from the partially closed office door ahead of him, the manager could just make out the shape of a human body. Terry Brooks lay on her back on the red tiled floor. Dressed in her short purple winter coat, her purse and keys and shoes were all scattered in the space around her. Standing there in the semi-darkness, it took Joseph a moment to recognize who she was because Terry's head was completely wrapped in one of the big plastic bags that should have been lining the nearby trash can, and just below the bag, there was the wooden handle of a butcher knife sticking out of Terry's throat. Within minutes of receiving Joseph's frantic 911 call at 6.12 a.m., the first officers and emergency medical personnel from the Falls Township Police Department were rolling in to the Roy Rogers parking lot, lights flashing and officers already preparing to close off the perimeter of the restaurant with yellow crime scene tape. When Terry's father called Roy Rogers restaurant that morning at about 7 a.m., his wife Elizabeth would later remember every word of the short exchange. This is George Brooks, Terry Brooks' father. Terry didn't come home last night. Is she okay? George's wife and Terry's fiance did not have to strain to hear the police officer's answer. No, she's not. She's been murdered. It did not take the lead detectives on the case very long to form a theory of what had happened inside the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant in the early hours of Saturday, February 4th. Because not only was Terry Brooks dead with no sign that she had been sexually assaulted, but also the store safe had been left wide open and more than $2,700 was missing. To detectives George Mitchell and Tim Stefan, that and everything else about the scene and the likely time of the murder pointed to a robbery homicide. According to early interviews with restaurant staff, Terry had sent two teenagers who had given the restaurant its final cleaning home at about 1.30 a.m. And even though restaurant protocol required a minimum of two staff in the restaurant at closing, Terry had decided to stay a little longer by herself to finish her paperwork. Then, dressed to leave work in her coat with her purse and keys in hand, police theorized that Terry's attacker may have waited for her outside and gained entry to the safe and money by pushing Terry back inside the restaurant as she was leaving. If Terry had fought back, the robber may have panicked and killed her. 
Police also considered the possibility that someone had entered the restaurant before it closed and had hidden somewhere inside with the intent of robbing the safe. In either scenario, robbery and money were the primary motives, and Terry, tragically, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it wasn't just the crime scene that suggested this had been a robbery gone wrong, it was this particular robbery against a backdrop of other recent robberies in the same region. During the last several months, law enforcement in and around Bucks County, Pennsylvania, had received so many reports of restaurants being burglarized that police and the media had nicknamed the perpetrator, or perpetrators, the Freezer Bandits. But given the brutality of Terry's murder, police also considered the possibility that there was a personal element to the crime, and that one of Terry's co-workers was the robber, and they had disliked her enough that, finding her inside the restaurant, they decided to kill her. Even as crime scene techs were busy gathering physical evidence at Roy Rogers, and the deputy coroner was collecting evidence from Terry's body, police investigators were at the Brooks residence out in Warminster, taking statements from Scott and Terry's parents. Since the majority of homicides are committed by a spouse or partner, Scott was an obvious person of interest. But there was nothing in Scott's story or in statements from Terry's friends and family that suggested he had a motive or connection to the crime. Terry's mother confirmed that her daughter had called Scott at about 10 p.m. the night before to say she was working late and he didn't need to stop by. And according to Elizabeth, there was nothing to indicate that the couple had quarreled or that the phone conversation was anything other than affectionate. And there was nothing in the couple's recent behavior that suggested trouble. Just three days earlier, Scott and Terry had paid for their honeymoon to Hawaii, and on the day of her murder, Terry and her stepmom had been looking forward to going shopping together for Terry's wedding gown. Where police did see red flags was in the description they heard from family and friends about Terry's relationship with her ex-boyfriend. And at the same time that investigators were tracking down that lead and corroborating the statements of Scott and Terry's family and friends, detectives interviewing Terry's co-workers quickly learned about Terry's confrontation two months ago with Steve Daly that had led to him being fired. And they also heard about the more recent incident involving the $40 missing from one of the Roy Rogers cash registers. But it wasn't long before Township Falls investigators pursuing all of these various leads began running into one dead end after another. In quick succession, they eliminated Terry's old boyfriend as well as Steve Daly from the suspect list. The ex-boyfriend had moved to California and had an airtight alibi. As for Steve Daly, he also had an alibi and he passed a lie detector test. Another Roy Rogers employee, whose fingerprints were found on the sill of the drive through window that Terry's attacker had almost certainly used as an escape route, as well as on the plastic bag that was wrapped around Terry's head, also passed a lie detector test. And in addition to having an alibi, the presence of that employee's fingerprints was explained by the fact that he had worked at the drive through window and that he had also placed the bag wrapped around Terry's head into the trash can from which the bag had later been removed. It wasn't until late February and early March that the investigation suddenly regained momentum. That's when two more female workers at fast food restaurants within a 100 mile radius of Fairless Hills were attacked in separate incidents. Both crimes appeared to be robberies, and at one of the restaurants, the young woman was stabbed to death. But the man arrested for that murder turned out to have no connection to Terry's death. And by the end of March, police had also captured the so-called freezer bandits and determined that they too had no connection to Terry's death. By July 14, 1984, the date set for Terry and Scott to get married, the investigation into the murder of Terry Brooks had gone cold. Despite a $5,000 reward from the Marriott Corporation for information that would lead to the arrest of Terry's murderer, and despite asking for help from law enforcement in other states, as well as from the FBI, and at the request of Terry's family, even consulting three psychics, the Falls Township Police Department had run out of leads, suspects, and the resources necessary to continue the investigation. Over the next 10 years, 
Terry's family suffered. George Brooks's hair turned white, his cheeks lost their fullness, and his smile, so like his daughter Terry's, rarely appeared on his face. George had bought Scott a new suit to wear to Terry's funeral, which was held on February 8, 1984, when there was still so many leads in the investigation into Terry's murder that police were practically working around the clock. But after that service, as the investigation stalled, the Brooks family lost touch with Scott. And a decade later, Scott would eventually marry and go on to have a child. With Terry's three siblings to take care of, George and Elizabeth Brooks also did their best to move forward. But they never stopped checking in with investigators to see if there was any new information about their daughter's murder. Finally, in 1990, the Brooks hired a lawyer to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Marriott Corporation. This kind of lawsuit seeks compensation for the emotional loss of a victim's family or survivors, like lost companionship. And these kinds of lawsuits are also very hard to win. But for the Brooks, the purpose of this lawsuit was not to get money. It was to get investigators for both sides to do their own digging into Terry's murder to see if the wrongful death claim had any legal merit. In 1990, investigators for the Brooks attorney handed their report over to local law enforcement. And at some point, that report was added to the stack of documents marked Terry Brooks that sat gathering dust in the Township Falls Police Storage Unit. But on May 22, 1998, 14 years after Terry's body had been discovered on the floor in the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant, the investigation into her murder was back in the media spotlight. The day before, on the third Thursday of the month, 82 well-dressed men and women could all be seen climbing the stone steps of a large Victorian brownstone located in the heart of downtown Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Each person entering the Old City Tavern wore a distinctive red, white, and blue rosette pinned to their chest, and each one was a member of a very select group of crime investigators who were well-known in law enforcement circles, but unknown to the general public. This was a regular meeting of the V-Duck Society, a unique crime-fighting organization co-founded eight years earlier by three nationally recognized forensic investigators. Named after Eugene Viduc, a French detective who is considered the father of modern crime investigation, its members select and review cold cases brought to them by law enforcement agencies, offering fresh perspectives that might help kickstart a stalled investigation. On the agenda for that cool and cloudy Thursday afternoon was a one-hour slideshow by Falls Township Police Sergeant Wynne Cloud that would present all the evidence police had gathered during their failed 1984 investigation into the death of 25-year-old Terry Brooks. Sergeant Cloud had recently been promoted by the township's new police chief to head up the department's detective division. At the same time, Chief Arnie Connelline had also ordered Sergeant Cloud to start reviewing cold cases. And the first case on that list was Terry Brooks. So, after the VDUC Society members, one for every 82 years of Eugene VDUC's life, had finished their formal lunch and were waiting for dessert, a very nervous Detective Cloud stepped up to the podium at the front of the grand dining room, a slide projector on the table next to him, and a large silver projection screen behind him. And over the next 60 minutes, VDUC Society investigators saw images of the 90 pieces of physical evidence and pictures that had been collected from the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers where Terry had been killed. The slides included fingerprints, Terry's bloodied purple jacket, the butcher knife sticking out of her throat, the contents of her purse scattered across the floor around her, the defensive wounds on Terry's hands and arms, the drive through window where the murderer had fled the scene of the crime, and a picture of the blood and tissue, assumed to be that of her attacker, that had been scraped from underneath Terry's fingernails. Back in 1984, when Terry was killed, an examination of that blood and tissue would not have revealed the identity of the killer. But since then, a lot had changed in forensic science. And now, in 1998, if police could find a suspect whose DNA profile matched a DNA analysis of those samples, police would have the breakthrough on this case that they needed. But first, they needed to find that suspect. 
When the presentation was over, members of the VDUCK Society had harsh words for the original team that investigated Terry's murder. It wasn't that the detectives back in 1984 weren't working night and day to solve a case that had produced enough statements to fill three large cardboard boxes. The problem, according to forensic psychologist Richard Walter, was that investigators had misinterpreted the crime scene. Instead of focusing on the robbery angle, right from the start, detectives should have been focusing on the extreme violence of the murder itself. Putting down his fork and pushing aside his plate of thick crusted apple pie, one of the three founders of the VDUCK Society went on to tell Sergeant Cloud that even though the case was 14 years old, the murder itself had already revealed a great deal of information about the killer. But police would need to begin the whole investigation over from scratch, starting with a DNA analysis of the tissue sample collected from under Terry's fingernails. And then Dr. Walters told police the two key questions that would lead them to discover the identity of Terry's murderer. Over the next four months, 32-year-old Falls Township detective Nelson Whitney took the lead on the new investigation into the Terry Brooks homicide, ordering a complete DNA analysis of blood, hair, and tissue samples found at the crime scene. Then, with the help of the VDUCK Society and a profile of the killer developed by Richard Walter, investigators re-interviewed Terry's parents, former co-workers, and friends of Terry who had not been interviewed during the first investigation. Investigators also combed through the funeral register that listed the names of people who had attended Terry's memorial service back on February 8, 1984, trying to track down the phone numbers and addresses of possible witnesses or suspects. And then, buried in the old files, Detective Whitney discovered the report that had been done eight years earlier by the investigators who had been hired to look into the wrongful death lawsuit Terry's parents had filed back in 1990. That report, along with an interview with Terry's friend, Sidney Bradney, the bartender at Coochie's Restaurant, where Terry and she had worked before Terry took the job at Roy Rogers, eventually led investigators to the suspect they'd been looking for. The challenge now was how to link this person to the crime and get a written confession. One month later, early one morning in October of 1998, Detective Nelson sat in an unmarked police car staking out a modest home that had become as familiar to him as his own house. It was trash day, and Detective Whitney had already seen the residents of this particular house put their bag of trash out at the curb. The detective also knew that the moment they dropped it there by the street, whatever was inside that bag was no longer considered their own private property. Instead, anyone who wanted to rummage around in that trash or take something out of the trash and keep it was legally free to do so. The investigator tensed when he heard the rumble of the garbage collection truck coming down the road behind him. Watching the truck in his rearview mirror, the young detective put his hand on the inside handle of the driver's side car door. And as soon as the garbage truck slowed to a stop and one of the workers hopped down and picked up that bag of trash in front of the house that Detective Whitney had been watching, the detective was out of his car and across the street. By prior arrangement with the garbage collection company, the detective took the bag directly from the gloved hand of the sanitation worker, carried it back to his car, tossed it into the trunk, jumped inside the car, and drove off to the Falls Township Police Station. With any luck, that bag of trash would contain a DNA sample from their suspect that would line up with the DNA of the tissue collected 14 years earlier from Terry's dead body. And sure enough, a smear of saliva scraped off the butt of one of the discarded cigarettes inside that trash bag would turn out to be a solid match. And on the evening of February 4th, 1998, on the 14th anniversary of Terry's murder, police knocked on the door of the house where the suspect lived. Based on the new information police had learned from Terry's friend, Cindy, coupled with the information the police would learn directly from the suspect over the course of the next six hours, here is a reconstruction of what happened to Terry Brooks in the early morning hours of that Saturday 14 years ago in the minutes just before she left work at her Roy Rogers restaurant in Fairless Hills. 
As Terry drove to work on the evening of Friday, February 3rd, 1984, she thought about her conversation the week before with her good friend Cindy. At the time they had talked, Terry had been so distressed that she practically broke down in tears. But now, a few days later, while Terry still felt upset, she also felt like she knew what she had to do to make things right. It wouldn't be easy, but as Terry was learning very quickly, she just needed to accept that other people were not always going to agree with or welcome every decision she made. By the time Terry had pulled into the parking lot of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers, she told herself it was time to stop worrying and turn her attention instead to the work shift ahead of her. A few minutes later, and Terry was stepping out of the foggy darkness into the brightly lit and cheerful interior of the restaurant. And after that, Terry didn't have time to worry even if she wanted to, because the next eight hours flew by. First in a rush of food orders and the clatter of plates and silverware, and then, after the restaurant closed to the public, in the bustle of staff cleaning up and getting ready to leave for the night. By the time Terry had locked the glass doors behind the two-person cleaning crew that left at 1.30 a.m., she had almost finished with her paperwork. And a half hour after that, and Terry was more than ready to go home. It had been a long day and night, and she was looking forward to sleeping late that morning. Pulling on her short winter jacket and reaching for her brown purse, Terry glanced around the office to make sure everything was in its place for the next day. But just when Terry was about to turn out the office light and leave, she stopped, sure that she had just heard a knock on the front door of the restaurant. Slipping her purse over her shoulder and gripping her set of keys in her free hand, Terry stepped through the kitchen prep area so she could peek out into the parking lot. Recognizing the person standing outside, Terry relaxed, but only slightly. Letting out a deep breath, she walked forward to open the doors for her unexpected visitor. Half an hour earlier, when the two-person cleaning crew had left Roy Rogers, Terry's killer had already been watching the restaurant from the parking lot next door for 30 minutes. Even without the car engine and heater running, the night was so unseasonably warm that inside of the car was still comfortable. Not that the killer would have noticed anyway. There were more important things to think about, like how Terry deserved everything that she had coming to her. Seeing her lock the door behind the two teenagers and disappear back into the dimly lit kitchen area, the killer reached over to the pack of Newports lying on the passenger seat. There was just enough time for one more cigarette. At 2 a.m., the killer had left their vehicle and was knocking on the front door of Roy Rogers. A few minutes later, the killer had followed Terry towards the back of the restaurant until they were both standing on the red tiled floor just outside of the kitchen. Only now, the two of them weren't just talking, they were arguing. And this time, Terry was not backing down. And in response to what Terry had to say, Terry's killer suddenly stepped forward and hit Terry in the face. The blow was so hard, it literally lifted Terry out of her moccasin-style shoes and sent her flying. She landed flat on her back, her keys and the contents of her purse skittering off in every direction. And that was just the beginning. Once Terry was on the floor, her attacker straddled her body and began choking her and pounding her head against the floor. Then, the killer reached up to grab a 7-inch long butcher knife from one of the tables above them. The autopsy report later showed that Terry would suffer not one, but several fatal injuries. In addition to brain hemorrhage, a broken bone in her throat, and a crushed voice box, Terry would be stabbed 20 times in the face, neck, and torso, as well as beaten with a length of lead pipe. But even as she was dying, Terry fought back. After her attacker had stabbed the knife once through her neck, Terry threw her hands and arms up to protect herself, and in doing that, her fingernails dragged along the surface of the attacker's skin. It wasn't until the second knife strike severed Terry's spinal cord and left her paralyzed that she finally lay still, her arms falling outstretched to either side of her body. The tip of the knife had dug so deeply into the floor that Terry's throat was pinned to the hard red tiles. Unable to scream or move, Terry stared up into the face of her killer. Still, it wasn't over. Breathing heavily with excitement, 
Terry's killer got up off the floor and, stepping to the nearby trash can, pulled out the clear plastic bag that lined the bin. Returning to where Terry lay trapped, her killer bent down and wrapped the bag around her head, and then watched as Terry's final breaths created a film of condensation inside the suffocating layers of plastic. A minute later, the killer had turned away, cracked open the door of the safe, and gathered up all the bills inside. Then, with a last look around, the killer pushed open the drive through window, climbed over the sill, and dropped down onto the pavement below, before running at a crouch back to the adjacent parking lot. There was the sound of a car engine starting, and then the killer was turning out onto Route 1 to head home. Fourteen years later, these two questions that forensic psychologist Richard Walter asked at the May 21st meeting of the VDUC Society would in fact lead police straight to Terry's killer. The first question was, who would Terry trust and know well enough to let into the restaurant at 2 a.m. the morning she died? And the second question was, who had such intense feelings for Terry that their attack would have been brutal enough to kill her several times over? There was only one answer. Terry's devoted fiancé, Albert Scott Keefe. It would turn out that when police reopened the investigation into Terry's death, Terry's friend, Cindy Bradney, would tell investigators that just the week before Terry was killed, Terry had confided that she was thinking of calling off her July 14th wedding. Eight months into her engagement, Terry had begun to have serious second thoughts about spending her life with Scott. It turned out he had a bad temper, and he was jealous and very possessive of Terry. Terry had begun to feel that the real reason he came to sit with her at Roy Rogers while she closed the restaurant had less to do with concern over her safety and more to do with ungrounded suspicions that she might be seeing other people. Scott also had money problems, and so he was angry when Terry left Coochie's restaurant, where they both worked, for a lower-paying job at Roy Rogers. When Terry had walked into the Doylestown travel agency with Scott three days before she was killed and paid for the couple's honeymoon, Terry may have realized that the time had come to end her engagement or delay the wedding before it was too late. And according to Dr. Walter and other VDUC Society members who would later review the investigation into Terry's murder, the safe at Roy Rogers may have been robbed, but the real motive for Terry's death had never been money. Instead, this had been a complex and personal murder committed by someone driven by both anger and retaliation. Someone who would rather kill Terry many times over than allow her to walk away from their relationship. Everything else about the crime, the robbery, jumping out of the drive through window, Scott appearing later that morning at the Brooks' house full of concern over not seeing Terry's car in the driveway, all of that had been pure misdirection. But now, 14 years later, on February 4th, 1998, armed with the DNA from one of Scott's discarded Newport cigarette butts that was tied to the hair and tissue found at the crime scene, investigators finally had the physical evidence they needed to bring Scott into the police station for questioning. By then, Scott and his wife were divorced, and Scott's life seemed to have come full circle. He was once again living with his mother in Warminster and working at an Italian pizzeria the next town over. Confronted with the new DNA evidence, new witness statements that described serious tensions in Scott's relationship with Terry, and the fact that he had failed a lie detector test, in the early hours of February 5th, 1998, Scott confessed to the murder of Terry Brooks. In a final twist to a case that had now captured national attention, Police also revealed that the report filed by investigators looking into the wrongful death lawsuit the Brooks had filed back in 1990 had also listed Scott Keefe as the most likely person to have murdered Terry. The report also included the witness statement that placed Scott in the parking lot adjacent to Roy Rogers about an hour before Terry was killed. Almost two years later, on Monday, June 5th, 2000, 37-year-old Scott Keefe was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Terry's father, George Brooks, died before Scott's trial, succumbing to a long illness just 15 months after he was informed that Scott had been arrested for killing his daughter. 
In February of 2000, four months before Scott's trial, Terry's family won its wrongful death lawsuit against Marriott Corporation. The $675,000 settlement was divided between attorneys and Terry's estate. We all like to believe that when we are home behind our shut and locked doors and shut and locked windows, tucked away inside of our bedroom under our covers, that we're safe. That our family members and their bedrooms, they're all safe. But in reality, that's not true. Most of the time it is. And most of the time that illusion of safety is enough that you don't think about it very often that someone actually could probably break into your house if they wanted to. Not all houses, some people are much more prepared than others. But most people never have to worry about that actually becoming a reality, someone breaking into their home. But there are people that do live that nightmare when the place they look at as safe becomes unsafe. Today's story is about someone who believed they lived in a safe house in a safe neighborhood. But in a moment's notice, that illusion was shattered. Before we get into today's story, if you are a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious told in story format, well, then you've discovered the right channel because that's all I do. And I upload three to four times a week. So if that's your style and you might be interested in something like that, I would encourage you to please gently incinerate, <laughs> gently incinerate, <laughs> Gently incinerate, <laughs> keep it together, here we go. Please gently incinerate the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of those weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 2017, a woman had just moved in to a beautiful home in Northern California that was just outside the suburbs. It was in kind of a more rural area. You know, there wasn't any street lights. Um, she did have neighbors, but they were you know, pretty far away from where she was actually staying, but she loved it. And it was this beautiful area. You know, she'd go outside at night on her porch and she'd look up and because there wasn't much light pollution, you know, she could see the stars and she just loved it. And even though she didn't see her neighbors very often, she knew them, they were older, they were really nice. It was just like a really warm, welcoming neighborhood, albeit people enjoyed their space, but it was, it was safe and it was a place that she truly loved and didn't expect to move anytime soon. Later that year, in the winter, she got home from work one day, she had a long shift, she was exhausted, and she pulls into her driveway, and when she steps out, she immediately smelled cigarette smoke. She didn't smoke, she didn't think her neighbors smoked, it was not a high-trafficked area, I mean, they're in kind of this rural part of Northern California, and her street, the only people that really ever went on it were her and her neighbors, and so she was thinking like, who was smoking near my house? But it was really, really foggy this day. She could barely see, you know, even when she was pulling into her driveway, she could only see what her headlights had illuminated on her house. I mean, it was like no visibility. She, she kind of glanced around, but she was like, you know what? I'm so tired. I just want to go and go to bed. So she just kind of forgets about the cigarette smoke, wasn't really that concerned about it. Uh, and goes in her house, and even though it's like seven o'clock, she's like, I'm just gonna go to bed. So she heads upstairs, takes a shower, and gets in bed. A couple hours later, she wakes up because she thinks she hears something on her first floor. At the time, she had a close friend that was taking classes in the city, but working outside of the city, and sometimes didn't have enough time to get back to his house to shower and clean up before work, and so she'd actually given him a set of her keys so that at odd hours when he was going between classes and work, he could just come to her house, take a shower, get changed. It was just a lot easier for him. And they were close enough, it wasn't a big deal. But he always texted her before he came to her house as a courtesy. Hey, I'm gonna be there taking a shower, you know, using your house just for a minute. And they rarely actually ran into each other because his hours were so strange. So when she wakes up and hears commotion downstairs, the first thing she does is check her phone for a text message because she's assuming that it's her friend who's just, you know, stopped by to, to use the shower or change or whatever he's gonna do. So she reaches over to her bedside table, grabs her phone and she opens it and it blinded her because she's just woken up and she kind of squinted at her phone and she couldn't really tell if there was any unread messages from him or not, but she just put her phone down and decided she would yell out uh, just a lot faster than trying to read this text message. So she yells out to him and there's silence downstairs. And she yells out again, hey, is that you? 
and there's silence. And then all of a sudden she hears very loud footsteps running across the first floor, charging up the stairs. She instinctively leaps out of bed, runs into her closet, which is right across from her bed. And as soon as she's literally stepping into the closet, she can hear whoever was downstairs now is in the hallway upstairs. And so the layout upstairs is there's a bedroom on the left, a bedroom on the right of the hallway. And straight ahead at the end, there's a bathroom. And the two bedroom doors were shut. The bathroom door was open. This person bombed up the stairs and ran right past the bedroom doors, one of them she was in, straight to the bathroom. It allowed her an opportunity to pop open the, the attic crawl space that the access was inside of her closet. She pops that open and is able to clamber up into the attic and is literally her feet are coming, are still being sucked up into the attic as whoever that was, they realize she's not in the bathroom and they've started charging back down. They punch open the door that she's in and they charge into her bedroom. She's trying to suck her legs up into the attic crawl space. She gets them up just in time and as her knees sucked up against her chest, when he comes into her bedroom, flips on the light and opens the closet. From her vantage point, she's looking down and just because of the way the view was obscured, she could only make out that it was someone wearing like kind of tattered jeans with the cuffs rolled up and dirty work boots. This was definitely not her friend. And as she's looking at his shoes and pants, wondering if he's gonna poke his head in and look up and see this crawl space where she is, and she has nothing she can do. If he decided to reach up and get her, there's nowhere for her to go. She didn't have her phone, it was on the bedside table, and she's just hoping that he doesn't see her. Luckily, he turns around and starts rummaging through everything in her bedroom, basically looking for her flips the bed over, knocks over the dresser, and then he screams this loud scream of frustration. And as he's screaming, she pushes the little crawl space cover over the spot. So now she's completely tucked away inside of the crawl space and she can't see anything. And for the next several hours, this person was literally screaming and running around the house, punching walls, screaming, where are you? running down the hall, reopening the bathroom, going into the other bedroom, clearly knocking things over, just going crazy looking for this girl. And then it slowed down and she heard him walking around the house and he would say periodically, I'm gonna find you. I know you haven't left yet, I'm gonna find you. And she started smelling cigarette smoke. He was smoking inside of her house. And then she realized that he was probably at her house when she first got in. That's why she smelled the cigarette smoke. For hours, she huddled inside of this attic crawl space that realistically is a little bit obscured inside of the closet. You would need to be looking for it to see it. And she just hoped that he didn't find her. And so she started counting. She figured if I can just count to a thousand with silence downstairs, if I can do that, that means he's probably gone. And so she would start counting and she'd get to like 200 and then she'd hear him whispering or yelling or knocking something over and she'd go back down to zero. And so all night she basically would try to count to a thousand until finally she did without it being interrupted. It was probably like five or six in the morning. So it's been hours and hours of this guy looking for her in her house. And she believed that it was safe enough for her to open up the attic crawl space and kind of peek back into the room. And so she moves the attic crawl space, the little square piece of wood that blocks the crawl space. She lifts it up and moves it. And she can now see that just from her little vantage point to where his feet were that she could see before, that clearly things have been broken. There's glass on the ground. She can see there's clothes on the ground and she wriggles down. There's no sign of him. It's been a while since she heard him. And she darts across her now destroyed bedroom. Her bed's in flip, things have been broken. There's holes in the wall. She gets her phone and goes right back in the crawl space. She calls the police and is like whispering as she's talking to them because now she's worried that maybe he heard her and he's gonna come back. She really doesn't know if he's gone. She just knew she had to call the police. Otherwise she was dead if he was still there. She gets the police on the phone. They say, we'll be right there, stay where you are. The police show up and she can hear them entering the house. They're yelling, police, we're coming inside. They search the whole house and they start yelling for her. They start yelling for her by name. And at this point, she feels comfortable opening up the crawl space and coming down to, to show herself. Sure enough, there's the police and they're like, there's nobody here. Do you wanna walk around the house and see if anything was taken? Every room was completely trashed. Holes in the wall, things broken. Whoever this was, was looking for her everywhere in the house and was basically rummaging through everything to try to find her. And the police are like, you know, you're very lucky that you thought to jump into that crawl space because we found uh, a number of your knives from your butcher block have been taken out. 
they were scattered around the house. It seems like he might have grabbed a knife and then in frustration was maybe looking for you and slashing at different things. Then he'd throw a knife and get another one. Uh, it's pretty clear this person was trying to do you harm and you're very lucky that you had the, the wherewithal to immediately, when you heard those running footsteps, charge into the closet and hide in the attic. That almost definitely saved your life. Although she would stay at this house for another three years after the incident, it ultimately proved to be too difficult to stay in that house. She was constantly afraid that it was gonna happen again. It was very traumatic. And so she ultimately moved. So it just goes to show that while we believe we are safe when we are home, the reality is, is all those locks and cameras and all the stuff we install around our house to keep ourselves safe, that's really just to keep the honest people out. The monsters out there, the evil people that want to do us harm, they don't care about breaking windows and forcing their way in. So you should always have a plan of what you would do if someone broke into your home, how you would handle it, whether it is an escape plan or even concealed weapons. But you should do something to protect yourself and have a plan in case the worst case scenario happens to you. No matter whether you believe this tragedy is the result of something paranormal or something normal and rational and explainable, no matter which way you feel or maybe somewhere in the middle, the details of the story itself, the actual facts of the story are horrifying. What actually happened to this poor family in the 1920s is it's just one of the more terrifying ordeals that I've ever come across and it's crazy to me that it's a true story. Without giving too much away, someone or something shows up on this farm and it doesn't leave. One of the maids starts hearing strange sounds. They start looking for this person or this thing. They start seeing things moving around in their house and there's every indication that someone is in the farm. Someone has snuck into the farm and is terrorizing us and then on March 31st, 1922, whatever it was, finally attacks. This is the story of the Hinterkaifeck murders. Before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the dark, strange, and mysterious delivered in story format, well then my channel is the one for you. That is literally all I do on this channel and I upload three to four times every week. So if that is of interest to you, I would ask you to gently 360 no scope the like button, subscribe and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's dive in. Back in the 1920s, there was a farmstead called Hinterkaifeck Farm that was located in Southern Germany in a very rural, isolated, heavily forested area. So the occupants of the farm were the live-in maid and the Gruber family. The Gruber family was Andreas, his wife Azalea, their daughter Victoria, and Victoria's two children, Josef and Azalea as well. And everything was going fine for the Gruber family and for their farm until the winter of 1921, when some very strange things started happening on their property. The first one to notice strange things happening around their property was their live-in maid. She spent the majority of her time in the main house and she was alone a lot of the time. And she started to notice when she was alone that she would hear tapping what sounded like in the walls, not someone in another room tapping, but literally something in the walls. And she would go up and she would listen and it would still be tapping, but she couldn't make sense of it. And then she started hearing a combination of disembodied voices and footsteps in the attic. And when she started hearing those footsteps and voices coming from the attic, she ran and told Andreas to say, hey, someone's in your attic. Andreas would go up, even though he was skeptical, he'd go up to the attic and he would look. And not only is no one there, but it was this totally open space up there. There wasn't really anywhere to hide. There was no one up there and there was no sign of anybody having been up there. There was no food, there was nothing. And so over the course of several weeks, the live-in maid kept saying that at night she'd be laying in bed and she would hear footsteps and voices from the attic. She'd hear tapping in the walls. She would tell Andreas and then Andreas, he'd be frustrated with her because he didn't really believe her and he'd go charging up into the attic and nothing would be there. And so she was just not having it. She'd been working with this family for a long time. She did not feel convinced that no one was there. She, she really thought this place was haunted. And so she ultimately tells the Gruber family, like, I'm sorry, but I can't stay here another night. Whenever I'm here, I feel like I'm being watched. And at night I can't sleep because of the footsteps in the attic and these voices. I know you've checked, but 
I can't be here anymore. And so she quits. And it really catches the Gruber family by surprise because they rely on her help. And so they're kind of thrown for a loop because they have to replace her. And so she leaves and now they need to go find a replacement. Over the following six months, they would not find a replacement and it would create an increased workload for basically everybody on the farm, which led to a higher stress level. Everybody's kind of on edge. You know, the departure of the live-in maid was a really big deal. And so you got to put that in perspective as you hear what happens over the next six months. At first, after the live-in maid had left, no one reported hearing any strange sounds around the house. You know, they were so busy that they didn't even have time to consider if there was any sounds in the house that they didn't recognize. But eventually, Andreas would later admit that he started hearing the tapping sounds and the footsteps in the attic and the disembodied voices, and no one's there. And so now he's becoming paranoid and he shared his paranoia with the rest of the family, who's now also hearing these sounds and these disembodied voices and the footsteps, and despite checking and now searching the whole property, like they've begun to like actually do a full-blown investigation. Everyone's just stressed. They don't know what it's coming from. They're mad at each other for like becoming paranoid. And so they just continue on with work and try to put it out of their mind that they're hearing these strange sounds. But the activity in the house would only intensify. What was initially just strange tapping sounds and what they thought were disembodied voices turned into things going missing around the house. Most notably, a set of their house keys went missing. And there's only so many people there. There's really not a good answer as to why they might go missing. And they only have a couple sets. It's a big deal to lose a set of keys. And they went missing and they couldn't find them. Once the keys went missing, the family couldn't stop thinking about the strange sounds in their house and wondering if there really was someone hiding in their house. And it was terrifying. And then when young Azalea, one of the grandchildren, suddenly went missing one night, the whole family is in full panic. They go out looking everywhere for her. They're yelling in the forest. They can't find her. And then finally they find her and she has no idea how she got out, where she went and what even happened. She just was like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know how I got out. She was exhausted. She was confused. They brought her back to the house and they're trying to get her to explain why you were doing that. She can't. They go back inside and sitting on the table is a newspaper that Andreas didn't subscribe to, no one in the family had brought, no one even in the area, it would turn out, subscribed to this particular kind of obscure newspaper and it's just sitting in their house. A couple days after that, they noticed that someone had clearly tried to break into their tool shed, which had loads of tools in there, very expensive. There was a lock on the outside and there was very deep gashes into the metal. It looked like someone had been, you know, hacking away at the lock to try to break it open. But you know, they're, they're living in a very isolated part of Germany where there isn't much ambient sound. And so it was strange to them that someone had been so violent with this lock, like hacking at this metal lock, presumably with something metal, and no one had heard it or reacted to it. None of the dogs had heard it, nothing. So just very confusing stuff is starting to happen around the property. But it would be what Andreas sees in the spring of 1922 that pushes he and his family over the edge from general paranoia to outright panic. So Andreas wakes up in early March of 1922. There was this huge snowstorm the night before. He gets up early and he goes to the back door of his house and he opens it up and he can clearly see that there are footprints that have walked from the forest, which is pretty far away from his property. They have a, quite a bit of acreage. There's footsteps that are clearly coming out of the forest all the way up to the door that he has now just opened. And he's looking down at these footprints and there's no return set of tracks. And so he's thinking to himself, well, whoever walked up to my house came into the house. So he shuts the door and locks it and immediately goes and wakes up his family and says, hey, why are there footprints leading up to the back door? Because there's, there's no footprints going away. Someone came to the back door and apparently came inside. His wife, his daughter, the grandkids, no one has a clue. The, the maid, nobody knows. They say, hey, we've been asleep. We have no idea. So now Andreas, I mean, he's obviously thinking about the strangeness that's happened in his house over the past couple of months. And so he's worried. So he opens the door back up and he looks and he's studying these footprints and he's like, I just don't get it. You have to turn around and walk back. Otherwise you're here, you're at the house. He shuts the door and he walks around his house. He looks at all of the different exits to his house. So he looks to see if there's exiting footprints, which it's scaring him thinking about it, which means someone would have come into the house and jumped out a window or gone out another door, but he's just checking. And as soon as he makes sure there's no other footprints, he does a scan of his entire house. 
because now he's convinced that someone's in his house. He goes to the attic. He goes all around. He's yelling. I mean, he's looking everywhere. There's nothing. There's no one in the house. The family's concerned, but you know, there, there's no one in the house. So he keeps everything locked and he goes outside and he starts tracking these footprints back to where they came from. And he walks all the way to the forest and they just kind of stop abruptly. Like they just started kind of magically at the edge of the, the tree line and walked right up to his house. But there's no clear origination besides it's just in the forest somewhere. And there's also no clear sense of what happened once they arrived at the door. So after doing one more loop around his property, he goes in the barn, he goes in the shed, he goes back in his house, he's checking the attic, he's looking everywhere and he can't find any indication that some stranger is here. He finally decides that he's gonna tell someone about what's been happening at his property. And so they did have a neighbor, Lorenz Schlittenbauer, who was his closest neighbor, who was not really that close, but you know, a couple hundred yards away. And he goes over and he tells Lorenz everything. I've been hearing sounds, you know, my maid quit because she was hearing sounds. We looked in the attic, we couldn't find anything. Then we started hearing sounds, the keys go missing. There's this newspaper in my house. My granddaughter's running out in the middle of the night. She's disappearing. She doesn't know what's going on. You know, these footprints, I, I can't make sense of it. And so Lorenz also not knowing what to make of it suggests like, hey, I have extra weapons. You want to take an extra rifle and arm yourself, protect yourself. And Andreas just says, you know what? No, I'm good. I'm going to pass on the rifle. I'm probably overreacting anyways, and I'm sure we're just fine. But it would turn out he was not just fine, and he probably should have taken up Lorenz on the offer. So just a couple of days after speaking with his neighbor about the weirdness happening on his property, the Gruber family got a little bit of good news, which was they finally were able to locate another maid, a live-in maid, to come stay with them to replace the one who had left because she believed the place was haunted. And so a few weeks later, on March 31st, 1922, this new maid shows up to Hinter Kaifek. But unfortunately, this would also be the same date a horrible tragedy unfolds at the Hinterkaifeck farm. Over the course of 24 hours, someone or something was in the barn on Hinterkaifeck and was able to silently lure in members of the Gruber family one by one without telling anybody else what they were doing. They would walk over almost like in a trance into the barn where they would be struck in the head by something called a mattock which is kind of like an ax. Blow to the head and they're down. As soon as they're down, whoever was in there, whatever was in there would take their bodies and move them to the corner and lay them down, kind of square them up against the corner of the barn and then cover them with hay. And as soon as they were, were deceased, he would go, whatever it was, would go back and lure in the next person. So over a whole day, each of these members of the family are being lured into this barn where investigators, nobody knows what it was that was luring them in. They weren't scared when they went in, their guard was down and they would go in and then get hit in the head with this mattock until there was four people stacked up in the corner. And at that point, the remaining two people on the farm uh, were still in the house sleeping and whoever was doing this went into the house and used the mattock to end their lives as well. Four days later on April 4th, a repairman who was scheduled to come to the Hinterkaifeck farm shows up to repair the feeding machine. He goes to the door, he knocks on the door and it's locked. And you know, he can see lights on inside. He can hear the dog barking inside, uh, but no one comes to greet him. Now the feeder was outside of the main house and it was actually on basically a, a public area of the farm. So he didn't need you know, them to physically get to the feeder and he knew how to fix it. So after trying the front door, going to the back door, looking in the windows and seeing lights, hearing the dog, but everything's locked. He just said, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do the job. So he goes into, or he goes into the area where the feeder is, he does the repair. And as he's leaving, he notices that the dog that was barking that was inside the house is now outside the house tied up. And so he goes over to, to that section of the house thinking, oh, well now I'll knock on the door. Someone's sure to see me. And again, no one comes to the door and the door, the back door that clearly must have just been opened to let the dog out is locked again. And so he's like, man, that's odd. And so instead of just leaving, he, you know, he finishes the job with the feeder and he goes over to Lorenz Schlittenbauer's house, the neighbor. And he says, hey, just so you know, I was just over at the Gruber family's farm. I fixed their feeder like they wanted me to, but no one was there, but maybe somebody was there because the dog was inside then it was outside. Don't know what's going on, but can you just let them know that I was here uh, because I couldn't get in touch with them. But it prompts Schlittenbauer to go check on the Grubers because 
you know, they haven't seen him in a couple days anyways, and so they figure they'll swing by and just make sure everything's okay. So they go over to Hinter Kaifek, and, you know, the lights are on in the house, the dog, sure enough, is outside, you know, the doors are locked, um, and they see that the barn is actually open. So they go over to the barn, and in the barn, at first they don't see anything, but in the back corner underneath some hay are four of the bodies of the Gruber family. They go inside and they find the remaining two bodies and no one else is there. Although there were signs of someone recently eating in the kitchen. The fire was lit, you know, it was like the house was being lived in at that very moment. Although to Schlittenbauer and anybody that was there, they have no way of knowing that it's been days since the Gruber family had passed away. And so they end up leaving and getting in touch with authorities. So the police show up and they're able to determine with relative certainty that the tragedy took place on March 31st. But for four days afterwards, someone lived in the Gruber house, slept in their beds, ate their food, lit fires, lounged around inside, they played with the dog, they milked the cows. I mean, they like lived in this house. They ran the farm for four days. And other neighbors would even say that, yeah, you know, we saw smoke coming out of the chimney on, you know, April 3rd and April 2nd. And so it was confirmed that someone had been staying in this house, which is so creepy. And so the police are a little bit baffled and they're like, okay, well then it was probably a drifter. You know, target of opportunity, they probably saw this isolated farm and they probably were gonna rob them, stay there a little bit and then leave. But when they searched the farmhouse, there were large sums of cash that were just out practically in the open, like barely hidden that had not been taken. And anybody that was robbing the place would have taken the cash. And so probably wasn't a robbery, which leaves maybe a crime of passion, but they were like, what's the motive? And unfortunately, Andreas was not particularly well liked in the town that was nearby. And so there was lots of people that didn't like Andreas, which made it really hard to, to whittle it down. So they started just interviewing like crazy. They're talking to hundreds of people that were in connection with, that could be connected to this, but they're getting nowhere. Uh, they did feel like Lorenz Schlittenbauer was probably the, the best suspect because he, he's right there, he's right next door, he's their neighbor. And in fact, he had wanted to marry Victoria, the, the daughter, uh, and Andreas had told him outright no, and they thought that that could be a reason. Um, but like the big issue with Lorenz Schlittenbauer being the primary suspect is you know, he had a farm to keep and a family to, to take care of. And so how could he have committed this crime and then ran the Hinterkaifeck farm for four days and lived there and slept there without his family knowing. And his family's like, no, he's been here with us. And so the police, you know, they aren't able to solve it. They don't really have any decent suspects. And so they kind of leave it with, well, whoever did this uh, probably had been there for about six months, potentially, before they committed the crime and then stayed there for a few days afterwards and then vanished. And to this day, they have not been caught. And they even reopened this case in 2007. But they found that, you know, despite the number of suspects and despite the evidence available, it just wasn't enough to provide any sort of clarity on what actually happened. So it remains a huge mystery. So like any other high profile unsolved mystery, there are literally hundreds of potential explanations for what could have happened. But what I'm most interested in is what you all think could have happened. I will do my best to look through your comments and I'll respond to the ones that are the most interesting uh, or the most plausible. So please, if you would, in the comment section, let me know what you think happened at Hinter Kaifek. And if you haven't already, please gently 360 no scope the like button, and then please also subscribe and turn on all notifications so you get more content just like this in the days to follow.
That's going to do it, guys. I hope this was interesting. If you want to get in touch with me, you can reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. And I'm also very active on TikTok. My handle is Mr. Ballin there as well. And that's going to do it, guys. And I will talk to you soon.